All right. Uh, go ahead and have your homework out. Books open to page 48. And uh, you answered four questions. Questions 23 through 26. And you did problem 13 for homework last night. Good. I think minimal work there on problem 13. So hopefully you are able to get that correct. No, their answers disagree with yours. Somebody's wrong. I'm not sure who. Mm -hmm. All right, number 23. To find viscosity, give an example of a liquid with extremely low viscosity and of another with extremely high viscosity. Uh, Audrey, what'd you have? Okay. Viscosity is a liquid which is Okay, um, not that liquid hydrogen is necessarily a commonly occurring liquid. Uh, anyone have maybe a, a little bit more normal liquid with low viscosity? Or liquid air. Liquid air and yeah, that's not naturally occurring. Something like, um, I don't know, acetone or nail polish remover, ladies, very low viscosity. Um, things like a paint thinner, a low viscosity. Um, and then a high viscosity, even melted cane sugar, it's true, maybe something like honey, a little bit more naturally occurring, which is, you know, it's a, a form of melted sugar, I suppose, but it exists at room temperature. Oh, um, but good, it's the resistance to flow due to intermolecular attraction. Number 24, why does a real liquid not exhibit laminar flow at the interval of a, it says the pipe, like what pipe? A pipe. Um, <laughs> Kendall? Okay, yeah, there's, there, there's an attraction at the wall of the pipe that produces little swirling motion, little eddies there, and so, um, good. Uh, so it actually flows faster through the middle rather than all the way across around the edges of the pipe. The flow is slower. Uh, number 25, state the principle of continuity in an equation and in words. Michael. The principle of continuity states that volume flow rate at any two points must remain constant. Um, the equation is A1 times G1 equals A2. Very good. And what is Bernoulli's principle? Sounds like a type of pasta or something, or maybe an Italian restaurant. Uh, what is Bernoulli's principle? Audrey? Bernoulli's principle is the inverse relationship between lateral pressure and velocity squared. Good. That lateral pressure and velocity are inversely proportional. Good. Yesterday we were talking about uh, Archimedes and Archimedes principle uh, dealt with this idea of things floating. Why does something float, Kendall? Um, per Archimedes. Of the density. Yeah, density is what it boils down to. Now, that's not exactly how Archimedes put it, but that's really what we extrapolate out is that density is what determines whether or not an object floats. And uh, Archimedes more specifically said this, that the upward force that acts on an object is equal to what, Michael? The upward force that a liquid exerts on an object is equal to what? The amount of weight the object has. Mm, no, Audrey? Um. Weight of displaced liquid. Weight of displaced liquid. So the question of the massive, the massive ship, how it floats. Well, it is massive and it weighs literally tons. But you know what else weighs tons? The water it displaces. And it displaces more weight in water than it itself weighs. So remember yesterday we said the key is to displace more water than you weigh, right? With Chloe, we need to put a vest or something on her so she will displace more water than she weighs. As long as we can get her to displace more water weight than she weighs, I think she's like 40 pounds. Like this tall, like this big around. <laughs> we do feed her, I promise. In fact, some cases we tell her, no, you need to finish that. I'm full. No, eat, child, eat. Anyway, <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, if it's candy, she'll eat it. She's happy to eat that. It's like vegetables and savory meats. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Anyway, um, just offended all the vegetarians out there on YouTube. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> vegan teacher what <laughs> anyway um but uh yeah so it, by displacing more water weight you get more upward force what do we call that upward force michael buoyant. buoyant force good that buoyant force is equal to the weight of displaced liquid that's what archimedes said A buoyant force equals weight of displaced liquid so the key there is 
if you're going to displace more water than you weigh, or something's going to displace more water weight than it weighs, the density is what makes the difference, right? And so we looked at a problem last night for homework, problem number 13, and uh, readeth that if thou wouldest, Kendall. All right, so there were two equations. One of them was the equation for buoyant force. One of them was for the weight of the object, and they are actually the exact same equation. What was that equation that we used the same for both of these, Kendall? Um, rho VG. Rho VG. Now, the difference is what, you're, what rho VG you're talking about. I did say the G is going to be the same, because wherever you're at, right, gravity pulls the same on the water as it does on the on the object that is being submerged in the water. The volume at maximum submersion will also be the same. Again, this is why we said that density makes the difference. Buoyant force, though, which density are we looking at, class? The density of the liquid itself. So the buoyant force, remember, buoyant force is weight of water or liquid more generally displaced. So we've got to look at the density of the liquid. For weight of the object, we've got to look at the density of the object. So in this case, we'll say the density of the ramp, density of the raft. We'll talk about ramps later this year, but not today. And in this case, the liquid more specifically is the water. Make sense? So again, if buoyant force is greater, then the object floats. If weight is greater, object sinks. Down she goes. All right, so for the buoyant force, let's start there. We are dealing with water. Does it give me a different density in the problem, or are we just going to have to assume a thousand? A C with us. So it's not C water or anything like that. They've done one of those problems to us recently, I think. And then volume. How do I find the volume of liquid displaced? Well, it's whatever the volume of the object is. And in this case, it's a uh, it's a raft. How do I find the volume of the raft? Back to Kendall. Um, multiply. What? Yeah, like times width times height, right, is your volume. So we multiply all three of those together, Kendall. What did you get? Two point one six cubic meters of volume, and uh, we didn't need to round that. That came in evenly. Of course, for gravity, we'll assume Kendall. All right, and of course, this is the kilograms per cubic meter. So we just have to multiply all those numbers together. And uh, what do we get for the buoyant force that's acting on the raft? Kendall? Um, 2.116 E3? Mm -hmm. I got E4. 1,000 times 2.16 times 9.8. Let me try it again, make sure I'm not wrong. Yeah, I'm getting E4. I'm getting 21,168 newtons. Oh, yeah. I just got it now. All right, got it now? All right, so that's a, that's a lot of newtons, right? But remember, there's going to be a whole lot of newtons of weight as well. I mean, if Michael's laying there on the ground, all right, load me up. I'm going to bench press this raft. All right, how much? He's like, I got this. How much is the raft going to weigh? Well, we got to do the same thing. But the density of the raft, it does give us in the problem, Michael. It is. The volume is going to be the same 2.16. The G is going to be the same 9.80. So how much does the raft weigh? That's a weird number. I had 12,658.464. All right. 12,600-ish newtons, okay? Uh, we'll keep the exact number for now, though. So notice, which is greater, class, the... Uh, the weight or the buoyant force? Buoyant force, considerably greater. So if we made a water raft, which again is silly, right? But a raft out of this, the same size raft out of water, it would weigh 21,000 newtons. So that's the amount of water displaced. That's the weight of water displaced. That's the buoyant force. So clearly, this means we could put things onto the raft and it would still float, right? Because as long as you keep the weight, 
under 21,168 newtons, you good, right? So the problem asks, um, what is the maximum load the raft can support? What will I do to finish the problem now, Audrey? Subtract, take the, the weight of the, uh, oh man, I just deleted that. Uh, take, oh well, whatever. Uh, take the uh, buoyant force and subtract away the weight, and uh, not that the other's gonna make a whole lot of difference. And what do we get for the um, weight of the load that we can support here, Audrey? Now again, this is a very specific sounding answer. Our answer can't be more exact than numbers we are given. And looking at sig figs we're given class, we're only allowed to have two. So we're gonna say approximately, how much can we put on this raft, Audrey? Good, or 8,500 8, newtons. Either answer would suffice there. How many of the 8,500 newtons you can load on there? Did we get the correct buoyant force at least in our work? Okay, do we get the correct weight of the raft in the work? Uh -uh. Okay, so that was the problem there then. All right, questions on Archimedes principle. Does it make sense now how this works? All right, uh, so 85, that's about a ton. You can put about a ton on the raft and it still floats. So yeah, that's not bad. Nice big raft. Questions? All right, well, let's change gears. We've been working with hydrostatics where the liquid isn't necessarily moving. It's just exerting these forces, right? Downward force, F equals A rho GH. Lateral force, F equals a, ha a half A rho GH. Upward force, buoyant force, rho VG, right? Also, there's pressure that uh, deter is determined by depth. All of these things we've talked about with liquids. Now let's talk about liquids that are moving. Next section, you notes know, hydrodynamics. Hydrodynamics. The study of liquids in motion. Hydrodynamics, the study of liquids in motion. Hydrodynamics, the study of liquids in motion. And uh, the first thing we want to talk about is this fact that in general, liquids to some extent resist motion. Um, liquids have this reluctance to flow freely. Now, we don't necessarily think about it, right? We take water and we, I'm not actually going to pour it out because I want to drink it. Okay, I pour it out. Pour it's just fine, right? No big deal, right? But there is still a little bit of resistance to flow. You need to see it still along the top, right? Some of the water clings to the sides of the container, right? The water also kind of clings to itself to a degree. And so because of intermolecular attraction, liquids have a resistance to flow. The liquids that have the greatest resistance to flow have a particularly strong attraction to each other. Uh, for instance, uh, we mentioned honey as we went over the homework, or molasses. Has anyone heard the phrase slow as molasses? You're slow as molasses. Yeah, any of you ever actually like made like um, gingerbread cookies using molasses, you've actually tried to pour the molasses out, like trying to scrape it out, it's just really sticky, right? That stickiness, that cohesion between the molecules of the molasses or the honey or whatever is what causes it to be reluctant to flow. We call this viscosity, viscosity. I believe you had as a vocab word or will have as a vocab word viscous, thick, sticky, cohesive, used of a fluid. I still remember that was the definition of viscous when I was in high school in English class. The reason I remember it was because I always said it wrong. Instead of thick, sticky, cohesive, I said thicky, sticky, cohesive, oozed of a fluid. Anyway, I don't know why. I was weird, okay? I still am. Oh, but it helped me remember. I still remember the, the Abeka definition of viscous. Viscosity, it's reluctance to flow. Viscosity is reluctance to flow. It's in, measured in a unit called poise. You don't actually have to know that term, but um, it's a large unit, so you'll notice that the book, when they put the table together, used a smaller unit, centipoise, hundreds of a poise. Um, we're not gonna get into the math behind viscosity because it's so challenging um, to account for viscosity in liquids. Um, really, truly, with what we wanna talk about, with what you read about in your homework reading, this viscosity just messes with the math. And mathematicians and scientists are lazy. And let's be honest, most liquids that we would use in scientific research, like water for instance, they're nothing like honey and molasses, right? The viscosity is minimal, it's low. And so if we choose to say, let's just ignore viscosity, 
it doesn't really alter the math too much. And mathematicians are lazy. So for our purposes, we're going to assume we don't have to deal with viscosity. We'll admit up front it is a thing that viscosity exists, that it would mess with the math. But as we work with the math here in this unit, we're going to kind of just gloss over the viscosity. Now, that said, the book does talk about some different effects that would happen if you tried to, uh, for instance, have water run through a garden hose. Anyone ever notice when water comes out of the garden hose? Well, for one thing, if you do a little crimson hose and stuff, it might bur burble a little bit as it comes out. But also, sometimes you get bubbles coming out of the hose, especially if you turn it up really high. That doesn't mean there's soap in the water. These little bubbles actually come because along the edges of the hose, it's not perfectly smooth, right? And so as the water passes over little ridges, as the water rushes by, creates little, not vacuum pockets, but low pressure pockets, right? And the low pressure actually can suck little bits of water and vaporize it in the low pressure. And the low pressure forms bubbles and these bubbles kind of come out with the water. So the, the flow is not smooth, okay? Also the water then along the edges of the hose isn't free to flow. The water in the middle is. So the water isn't flowing with the same velocity all throughout. It's faster flow at the middle, slower flow at the sides. Also, as Kendall mentioned uh, when I asked the homework question, um, also because of a little bit of a cohe an adhesion to the sides of the um, the, the garden hose or even a pipe, right? You're going to get a little bit of a swirling effect as the water kind of sticks just a little bit to the sides of the hose and or the sides of the pipe and produces little swirling eddies that slow the water down even more. Um, so there's this slow down effect right along the edges of a pipe. Yeah, we're going to ignore all of that, okay? Because if water weren't viscous, you wouldn't see all of that. Also, if water had a uniform, or liquid in general had uniform density throughout, you wouldn't get any of that weird effect. And if you, water or liquid couldn't be compressed at all, and it's largely incompressible anyway, right, then, then this wouldn't happen. So we mathematicians, for the sake of the math being easy, we like to deal with what are called ideal liquids. Ideal liquids. Now, be honest, Michael. Was there a time in your life when you sat down and thought about like your ideal woman, like the characteristics of like if, she, if you could get everything you wanted on your checklist? Do you ever take time to make that list? Just maybe thought about it. And, uh, and, and ladies, my, my sister, I think actually did this. So throwing her under the bus here. Sorry if you're watching. Um, but <laughs> it's the one I call Pookie. Anyway. <laughs> Um, anyway, I think she actually made a list of like, okay, what do I want in a man? And um, first of all, he's got to be a man. I think that was about, just kidding, just kidding. Anyway, <laughs> um, did, did y'all ever make that list? Okay, these are the things that I want you, hardworking, industrious, loves the Lord, um, you know, will love me and care for my family, good with kids, you know, all those things you make that list. Or maybe again in your mind, you know, drop dead gorgeous and short list. Just kidding. <laughs> There's obviously more to it than that. Obviously. Well, the, the problem with the, the ideal woman or the ideal man, other than me, there really isn't any man out there. Okay, just kidding. There really aren't men and women out there that are ideal. Like, everybody has their flaws, and you even know for yourself, right? You have your own flaws, too, right? So you know, I, Michael's like, nah, I'm perfect. Okay, perfect in every way. But we all have flaws, right? And so there are certain things where maybe you prioritize the checklist as you get closer to that marriage age, and we're like, well, anyway, we'll leave off on this. <laughs> well, he has bad PO, and he looks ugly, but he's a nice guy. Yeah, I guess I could deal with that. I know wear a nose plug and sunglasses around the house. I could probably get by with this, right? Anyway, <laughs> there is no such thing as an ideal liquid. It doesn't exist, any more than the ideal man or the ideal woman. What we really have are real liquids, and real liquids don't do what ideal liquids should do. It, they, they can't measure up. But the math is so much easier in this ideal world. Three characteristics of an ideal liquid. First of all, an ideal liquid is, as was mentioned, non-viscous. We have to assume no viscosity or the math doesn't work perfectly. And we don't want to necessarily account for, you know, viscosity. Again, in our defense, as scientists and mathematicians, though we are lazy, water's viscosity is so low, it is largely negligible in the math. The math will almost work out perfectly anyway. It's not worth the hassle, at least not at our level. Now, if we were doing research that would affect you know, millions of lives and um, 
you know, the safety of the nation, could it be at risk if we blew this experiment? Okay, maybe we would, but for our purposes, we'll assume we're working with ideal liquids that are non-viscous, that are, as was mentioned a moment ago, of uniform density. Absolutely no clumping of water, mo liquid molecules in any location, which again is largely true anyway of water, which is our most abundant liquid, right? It's largely true anyway. It's almost perfectly uniform. So it's not too big of a stretch with water to consider it an ideal liquid and, and uh, incompressible. I mean, let's be honest. When was the last time you tried to squeeze a water balloon and you were able to squish it down smaller without it busting? It doesn't happen. It's mostly incompressible anyway. In fact, we're going to look at a problem later on this year that shows the compressibility of water, and it really is almost zero. Okay, so it's not really that big of a stretch to say that water is an ideal liquid, even if it's not perfect, right? It's kind of like where you come to, like, okay, is my wife perfect? She's really close, okay, she's perfect for me. Right, that's all that really matters. Okay, so for our purposes, water's close enough. What is lump water in there, even though water isn't truly an ideal liquid. Uh, by the way, the book also mentions that pressure begins to drop as, um, as uh, liquid passes through a pipe. This lateral pressure drops just because of the, uh, the friction, if you will, uh, that viscosity along the edges of the pipe. But we're gonna ignore all of that. We're gonna live in a utopia, an ideal world. And if our liquids were actually ideal liquids, then as they flowed through a pipe, they would demonstrate something called the principle of continuity. Principle of continuity. Continuity. <clears throat> it's in your book. Principle of continuity. Uh. Principle of continuity basically says this. As water flows through a pipe, if the pipe were to narrow, the pipe were to widen, it doesn't matter because an incompressible, uniform density, non viscous liquid will flow through the pipe at the same volume flow rate. That is that a volume of water that passes through this section of pipe in a certain amount of time will be the same amount of volume that passes through this section of pipe in the same amount of time. Does that make sense? Well, you understand to get an equal volume through in the same amount of time, if the pipe is wider, the water liquid does not have to flow as quickly, correct? But if it narrows down, the liquid must flow, flow through much faster to get the same volume through. Does that make sense? So although the principle of continuity says volume flow rate must be constant, really what we're thinking of is the speed with which the volume of water passes through. As it narrows down, it must go faster. For instance, a pressure washer. Has anyone ever used a pressure washer with the pressure washer turned off? You just use the hose and all? It still comes out pretty fast, doesn't it? Because that pressure hose narrows down considerably. And the sprayer narrows down considerably. You could still, yeah, anyone ever run a pressure washer across your foot by accident? Okay, turned on, that could be, that could be very painful. Um, potentially remove toenails. Uh, always good to wear some kind of footwear that covers the toes when you're pressure washing. Um, but even with the pressure washer off, like you, it, it hurts a little bit if you've got it cranked full of pressure just because you're narrowing down the flow of water so much that the same volume of water has to flow through. We would put it this way in equation form. The cross-sectional area times the velocity, this isn't volume, but velocity, at one point of a pipe has to equal the cross-sectional area times the velocity at another point in the pipe, or garden hose, for instance. Now, okay, garden hose is a poorer example because you really will get start to get some of these real liquid effects, but again, we're assuming an ideal liquid, so we're not gonna have to worry about any of that. Notice once again, there's an area on both sides of the equal sign. You know what that means? We can substitute. D squared diameter squared is once again going to roughly be analogous to area because the one fourth pi's would cancel. If you look at your textbook, they don't take the easy way out, but that's because they're not as lazy as I am. I'm a math teacher first and a physics teacher second, so eh, I'm lazy. I will take all the shortcuts I can find, and this is one. We're going to substitute the diameter squared again for the area. So looking in your textbook at page 46, look at the example problem. And you see, by the way, a little sketch there of a piece of pipe that's really wide, goes narrower, and then widens back out a little bit. And again, just comparing the rate of water flow. 
as it narrows down, the water has to speed up. As it widens back a little bit, the water is able to slow down again. Read go, uh, example 3.5 for us, if you would, Kendall. The water is high up the house, that's the Notice by the way, like under the toilet, or maybe looked under the sink or something to see the supply lines. Really narrow. So that's probably that one centimeter, that one centimeter pipe there. The incoming pipes are usually about two centimeters wide. That's that copper pipe that you might see. Um, four centimeter pipe. I'm not quite sure what that is. That might be the wider supplies going to the uh, going throughout the walls of the house to the fixtures. I'm not sure. That might be coming into the house. Is the four centimeter supply? I'm not sure. I'm not a plumber. I have replaced some plumbing fixtures, but it's it's always one of those where you wonder when you're done, right? Is it still going to work? So far, it's worked every time. Because if I'm scared, I call the plumber. All right, anyway. <laughs> so we actually have three sections. So we can extrapolate this out and say uh, that uh, A1V1 equals A2V2 is A3V3 here, right? Where again, we're going to substitute diameters. So the diameters are one, two, and four. So let's plug in one squared, two squared, four squared. So one squared class, one. We'll plug in the V in a minute. Uh, two squared, four, and we'll plug in the V in a minute. And then uh, four squared, 60. 60. And we'll plug in that velocity in just a moment. That actually will give us one of the velocities. Which one? The the two centimeter, that's this middle one here that we put the two centimeters in, right? We squared it to get four. So this velocity, it said, was 20 meters per second. All right, so we don't know V sub one or V sub three. Let's just look right here. Ignore the last part and just solve that part of the equation. It's really easy because one times V one class is V sub one. And four times 20 is? 80, I think it's point, right? Or is it point zero? Oh, it's point zero, three safe fits. 80.0 meters per second flowing through that one centimeter pipe. It's flowing very, very quickly. Two centimeter pipe, it's down to 20 meters per second. Now let's look right here. How fast, multiply, divide out to 16, how fast is it flowing in the four centimeter pipe? It drops all the way down to only 5.00 meters per second because it's widest. So the water is able to slow down considerably there. Does that make sense? Questions on how to use principle of continuity. Turn to page 48. Page 48 and read problem number nine for us if you would, Audrey. So how many of y'all have, have done that before where you, uh, you close off the end of the hose maybe with your thumb? You're narrowing down the diameter. What does the water have to do? It has to speed up, right? Volume flow rate has to increase. It's not your fault that a younger sibling happened by at that time. I mean, who would have predicted that? <laughs> um, you're just trying to help mom out by watering the plants, right? The, the brother or sister got in the way. I mean, it's not my fault. Or cat. Yeah. Oh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> we do not advocate for the spring. <laughs> It won't hurt the cat. What are we talking about? Get the pressure washer out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, Kendall. Kendall loves cats. Even, even Audrey has, all of y'all have cats, so we don't hate right, cats I here. I, I, just, I just hate cats that come in my yard that don't belong in my yard. Those cats I don't like. They spray stuff and leave that foul smelling odor. Ah, neighbor's cats. That's the ones we hate. Neighbor cats. Anyway. Um, so we've got the diameter of the garden hose, two and a half centimeters. That's a bow, right? This is maybe a little thick for a garden hose, but whatever. And uh, the nozzle, how many of you have had the, the sprayer nozzle? Like you squeeze it and it closes down so that you don't have to put your thumb over it. And, uh, and you can get different spray patterns because you squeeze different amounts and whatnot. Anyway, so the spray nozzle, when you pull it all the way down, closes that down to a diameter of only half a centimeter. So if the water's going three meters per second through the hose, how fast when it comes out? That's your seats.
What we notice, although it is in centimeters, and normally we deal with meters, the centimeters on both sides will continue to cancel, right? So that's been okay that we've had centimeters when it's on both sides. If we were finding like F equals A rho GH or P equals rho GH where there's not something on both sides, we'd have to go meters, but here we can go centimeters. Obviously square the 2.5 times the three, divide out the square of the 0.5, and how fast does the water shoot out of the sprayer nozzle? Poor kitty. Class? 75 meters per second. Yeah. All right. How many has, and that is two sig figs already. How many had 75 meters per second? Oh, I told you somebody was going to forget that. Don't forget the square diameters. All right, let's do uh, number 11. Read that one for us, Michael. Water flowing from a 4 centimeter pipe at the rate of 1.4 meters per second comes to a small point, 5 centimeter pipe, then a 2 centimeter pipe. Find the velocity of the last two pipes. All right. So this is very similar to the first one, right? 4 centimeters down to a half a centimeter and then out to a 2 centimeter. So a little different numbers here. Go ahead and do number 11. And check work. Square the fours get 16. Square the 0.5 get 0.25. Square the two get four. We know in the widest part of pipe, water is only flowing at 1.4 meters per second. Speeds up considerably in the in the narrow section. Slows in just a little bit, but still faster than it was here in the in the moderate section. Do we get 90 point meters per second and 5.6 meters per second for our answers? Questions on this? All right, now an interesting, uh, another interesting application here. Look back, if you would, on page uh, 45. I kind of an interesting demonstration that I'm too lazy to set up here, uh, but uh, they have this container of water with an overflow and water constantly pouring in in order to keep a constant height, therefore a constant pressure. Now, we know this, that if water were not permitted to flow through the lower pipe, maybe that spout at the end were closed off, then all the water would rise to the same height because water seeks its own level. But because water is able to flow through, there's only a certain amount of pressure called lateral pressure, forward pressure it has. But there's a certain amount of what's called lateral pressure. And you'll see that the lateral pressure drops as it goes along, correct? so that that which comes out of A, or that which rises up and is pushed up into the A spout is less than the B, less than the C, it just constantly drops right, as water goes along. The reason for this is that at the uh, wall of the pipe, you're losing just a little bit of lateral pressure because the water is actually um, being reduced by its own friction, if you will. The viscosity is causing that decrease in pressure. But it's a progression as you go, it gets lower and lower. We'll turn now to page 47. They did the same demonstration again, but this time they narrowed a portion of the pipe. On page 47, what has to happen in the narrow section of pipe? Water's gotta speed up. And notice there should be a gradual drop off like there was before, but there's a marked drop off for at C and D, and then it's almost like the water's actually able to rise back more at E. Is that, do you see that? The idea is this, that as the water is flowing, if the water starts to flow faster, the lateral pressure, not the forward pressure, right? Forward pressure would be greater just because it's moving faster. But the lateral pressure, the sideways pressure, is decreased. That's something called Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle.
Bernoulli's principle says this, that as velocity of a fluid increases, as velocity of a fluid increases, the lateral pressure decreases. As velocity of the fluid increases, the lateral pressure decreases. That's actually a squared proportionality relationship. I'm not going to get into the math behind it, so we won't bother with that. But just know as velocity increases, lateral pressure decreases. For instance, suppose we took Michael, or uh, Michael, let's see, yeah, you're, you're a little over 60. Let's take Shaquille O'Neal, for instance, since this is a hypothetical anyway. Y'all know who Shaq is? Mm -hmm. seven, foot, uh, seven foot two, I think. Huge guy. Okay. With his arms, if he went to our downstairs hallway, it's right at the legal minimum of six feet, okay? So he could actually stick both hands on the wall and actually apply a little Samson-like pressure, right? Let's consider that lateral pressure. If he were standing still, he could push pretty hard. Imagine if we were trying to walk forward. He wouldn't be able to push as hard, would he? If he were running, he'd barely be able to push at all. Now that's not, that's not an illustration necessarily of this, but it might give you a little bit of a mental picture. As the water's moving through a pipe or through a hose, for instance, if it's moving at a decent rate, the pressure on the wall is minimal. But if you can get the water to slow down or even stop, you're gonna get a much greater lateral pressure. For instance, ever had a garden hose that has a little hole in the side? And as long as the water's flowing through, you barely get a trickle out of that little hole. But if you cap the end of it, maybe you put that sprayer nozzle on, but you're not holding it. At that point, water shoots out. Now, I'm not saying to try this, okay, unless your parents have an extra hose that we're going to get rid of anyway. But you can try putting the hose on the end, the, the sprayer on the end, puncture a little hole in the hose, and spray just a little bit of water slowly. You, what you'll see is this, because when you aren't pushing, obviously water's going to be shooting out of that hole, right? With a great deal of velocity, a great deal of pressure. As you begin to squeeze on the trigger, you'll see the pressure come down less and less. And if you go full bore, barely anything's going to come out, right? But when the water stopped and velocity comes to, to nil, then you're going to get maximum lateral pressure. That's that sideways pressure on the wall of the hose. Does that make sense? That's basically what Bernoulli's principle is saying. Really not a lot of application with liquids other than maybe the garden hose with the hole in it, example. Or uh, y'all know what those, y'all ever seen those garden hoses that purposely have holes all the way down in? It's called a soaker hose. And it's not really a hose, especially maybe there's holes all along, so it just sprays little mist everywhere. And you can kind of shape it to whatever shape you're trying to water. My dad had one of those. But um, you know, a lot more application with gases that we'll look at with Bernoulli's principle then. All right, tonight for homework, you have one problem and you've got studying, okay? Do page 48, problem 10, and then study chapter 3, the liquid chapter. Study over chapter 3, the liquid chapter. There's like Bernoulli's principle and Archimedes' principle, the principle of continuity, there's Pascal's principle, so different principles in there, a lot of different terms as well, some equations. Study over chapter three, and on page 48, do problem 10. We'll take a look at this in our lesson tomorrow. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and you are dismissed.